Come on, church, let's give him a huge shout in this place. Thank you, Jesus, for being in this place today with us. We love your presence. We love being together today. And Lord, we just thank you. Lord, that you love being with us too. We love you, Jesus. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Do you know what? Isn't it great to come together? Have a wonderful, wonderful time this morning together. Well, we are so honored and privileged today to have Jeff Letts with us. It's absolutely fantastic. Come on, let's give Jeff a warm welcome this morning. And, um, you know, before Jeff comes and ministers to us, Jeff uh, is part of Hillsong Dominion Church. That's his home church. He's ministering uh, there next week. We are so, so blessed to have Jeff. Jeff could go anywhere in the country, but he has chosen to come here to impart into us this morning. So I'm telling you, you're going to be really blessed. Let's open our hearts and listen to God's Word. Jeff's been ministering for the last 36 years and in business too. So not just ministering and building the church of God, but also building God's kingdom in business. So I'm telling you now, we are going to be blessed this morning by a man that's been building God's house for the last 36 years. So I want us to open our hearts and just be receptive to God's Word. Is that okay? Before Jeff comes, we're going to show you a short video just about what Jeff does, and then Jeff's going to come to minister to us. From the outside, we would have looked like a well-to-do, happy family, and then I'd say within a year from that time, I remember uh, kind of our lives falling apart. Well, my, my father lost, uh, lost his business, um, lost his home, lost everything, and uh, that's when my father committed suicide. From there, my sister and I were taken away from my mother. She was declared incompetent. Uh, she, was, she had become an alcoholic and just was, she, she wasn't able to take care of us, so we were placed into foster care and then into an orphanage. And then uh, that's when I tried to commit suicide and was locked up in an institution. And so at 12 and a half, I tried to take my own life. Well, these guys found me sleeping in the hallway and it turned out that these four guys that were all living there, they were drug dealers. And so they said, if you want to stay here, you got to work. You deliver the drugs, we'll pay you and, and we'll feed you and, and you can have all the drugs you want. So yeah, at that point I was, I was 14, almost 15 years old. And I just looked at my life after living on the streets for a couple of years, and I just said, you know, I'm, I'm going to end up becoming a junkie. And, and I just cried out to God. And I said, God, if you're really real, would you help me? You know, that, that night when I got saved, um, my life just began to turn around. I, mean, I quit doing drugs. I went through high school. It was supposed to be four years. I went through it in three years, became an honor student. And I got to say, it was, it was one of the best times of my life. By this time, I met Margot, who's, who's now my wife. We were, we were high school sweethearts from 16 on, and we just started talking about what we wanted to do. And my foster father had become a financial planner. He said, Jeff, he said, you'd be great in sales. He said, you're such a good people person. He said, you know, why don't you come to work with me? Well, you know, typically in, in the sales business, the, the way that they motivate you is say, go get a new car, go get a new house, you know, all the outward trimmings. And the idea there is that they get you so, with such a sense of obligation that you have to go sell. And so I, I fell into that because these were my mentors. And all of a sudden, at 24 years old, I find myself credit card bills, two car payments, a house payment, a financed life. I'm frustrated at 24 because I'm sort of like, how do you get ahead? I mean, how do you, how do you get out of debt? I, I just didn't know, and that's when I cried out to God. I said, God, there's got to be a better way. Would you please guide me and open up a door for me so that I could 
personally become debt free and personally you know learn how to how to become financially independent and if i could really understand this i would devote my life to teaching this to people two weeks later is when i went to a financial seminar i just sat there amazed and it was like concept after concept that they taught i thought that's the answer that's the answer that's the answer yeah i want to do that so some of the basic principles that we learned just like in the course we started applying these principles found out that they work they're actually simple they're 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 easy to do but here's the key the daily disciplines that you do determine your future so from from age 24 i was broke uh, discouraged despondent about money by the time i was 31 i'd become a millionaire and the biggest principle i learned in there is it's actually easy for god to get money to you question is can god get money through you <clears throat> thank you haley well good morning, good morning. this is the best looking group i've seen all day Actually, you're the only group, but uh, it's, uh, it's a real honor for me to be here. And thank you, uh, D Pastor Dave and Faye, <clears throat> for inviting me. I saw them at a Hillsong event. I guess we first met at the conference about a year ago. And then I saw you just a few months ago. And they said, uh, you have, got, have you ever preached in Wales? I said, no. And they said, well, you know, this is like little Jerusalem, okay? So you have got to come to Wales. So this is my first time to preach in Wales, and it's uh, good to be here. <clears throat> um, I really hope that today that you are open-minded. In fact, I'd like to ask you all for a little group participation here. Would you please raise your right hand and make a fist like this? There you go, everybody. How many of you don't like to raise your hands? <laughs> So, and I want you to just pull down like that. Very good. You just flushed your mind. <laughs> and, you know, you can disagree with me today. I'm totally cool with that. <clears throat> um, but I do want to say this to you. You know, it's like a parachute. The only way that a parachute works is if it's open. Um, if you jump out of an airplane, you can't say, well, you know, let me see if God takes care of me. No, God gave you a brain to pull, pull the chute. And it's your mind is much the same way. Um, as this testimonial uh, I shared with you, in fact, could we put the first slide up? This was me when I first came to church um, and uh, thought that you might like to kind of see this, this picture here. Um, there you go. That's, no, that's not my daughter, okay? That was me. And that was at, at 15 years old when I first came to church and I got saved and I came living off the streets of Chicago for a couple years, was strung out on drugs. And God began to do something in my heart. And I began to realize that, you know, the, the script, there's a scripture in Isaiah that says, my ways are so far above your ways as human beings, they're like the heavens are from the earth. And so I looked at my life, at the mess that I'd gotten my own life into, and as I began to realize that I wanted God's ways in my life. This scripture that Pastor Fake just quoted, which is where David said, he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. You know that word righteous actually means someone that does the right ways of God. Wow. And see, when you come into to, to partnership with God, or the Bible calls it covenant, means a partnership. And that means that if you really want God's blessings on your life, that means that you, in a partnership, have to do your part. You know, people all the time say, well, well, I want God's supernatural power on my life, don't we all? But did you know the word supernatural it comes from two words? One is super, the other one is natural. And all that supernatural is, is God's super on top of your natural. You know, there, I hate to disappoint you this morning, but there are some things in your lives that God will not do for you. Now, I'm a man of faith. 
But as an example, this morning, I don't know about you, God did not brush my teeth. God did not take a shower for me and put deodorant on me. I had to do that myself. That's why he gave me a brain. The very first thing that God told Adam and Eve is he said, I want you to take dominion over the earth. So there are some things that God expects us to do, but when we do the possible, then God will do the impossible. But we have to be able to go do the possible. And many times, I know as a young Christian at 15 years old when I got saved, and that was, in fact, this month is 40, uh, 46 years ago, 45 years, yeah, 46 years ago. I'll be 61 in just a few months. 46 years ago, I got saved. And that began my life journey. And maybe you, you've, maybe if you've heard the, the promo video that we did, I talked about how that I began to realize when I got saved and my foster father, a young man that was 21 years old, took me in and the pastor of, of the church became sort of my, my second dad. And these two men began to sew into me and I began to realize that my future my history did not have to, or my destiny did not have to, my history did not have to become my destiny. And one of the, one of the toughest things when you come from a tough background is, is that it's so easy for the enemy to defeat you and to say, who do you think you are? Why do you think that God would, would want to pour out a blessing on you? Well, see, the real reason, as we're going to talk about today, the real reason behind God wanting to bless you isn't just so you can have a big house and a big car and a big this, although it's okay to have that. But the real reason God wants to bless you is so that you can be a blessing to others. It's actually easy. I remember my pastor telling me this. He said, Jeff, it's actually easy for God to get money to you, but the question is, can God get money through you? And that's a decision that you have to make. It's a choice. So as you begin on this journey, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about sort of some of my frustration in church as I was 24 years old. And by the way, I was a tither like, 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 uh, like, like Faye. I got my first job at 16 years old stocking shelves at a supermarket like a Tesco or a Sainsbury's. And so I'd go to school during the day and, and at, at 3.30 they'd let us out and I'd get in my, my car um, that, that I had, it was an old, you know, beat up one, you know, it was kind of, you know, had duct tape on some of the, some of the body just to kind of keep it together, you know, wasn't anything pretty, but I'd drive to the supermarket and I'd work basically from 4.30 until 10.30 at night, stocking shelves and mopping the floors. And then I'd go home and I'd do a couple hours of study and get in bed at midnight and get up early the next morning, go to school. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. My, my foster father would receive benefits for me because I was an orphan. Both my parents, my father died when I was five. My mother died when I was seven. And so he would get benefits. And I remember that many of the people in our community were living on benefits. And I never forget at 16 years old, I said, Michael, you know, how, how can I make money? And I remember him sitting down at the kitchen table saying, Jeff, benefits are not an alternate source of income. Benefits were designed to help people that can't work, not won't work, but can't work and can't help themselves. But Jeff, they're really designed to help you to, to become a contributing member of society. So he said, Jeff, I'm not going to give you an allowance. You have to go work, son. And I said, yes, sir. And so I was like, Faye, I actually went. I, I went to every single store in our little village. Okay, it was about 10,000 people in this, in, this, in this one village that was closest to us. I went to about 12 stores and applied and finally got a job. And so, but I had questions in the church. See, my, my first job, I was making $30 a week. This was in the U.S., and I'd put in $3 in the offering. That was my tie. That was 10%. And then offerings are a whole different issue. Uh, if, if some of you want some, some resources, I'm just going to mention this today. I'll tell you, I'm not going to take a long time to promote this, but... Um, you know, I'm going to try to pack in in, in 35 or 40 minutes uh, what it's taken me 35 or 40 years to study. 
And so a few years ago, I wrote a book called True Riches, Prosperity with Purpose. And that this, because I, I already know that many of you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be doing a book signing at the back. I already know many of you are going to go, I just have one question. 99.9% .9 of the time, your answer is right in here. And, and in fact, in the back is my email address. And I tell this to everybody. If after reading the book, you have any questions, email me. I will answer your email. It might take me a week or two, but I will answer it, okay? But in here, I talk about what's the difference. But in fact, can we just go to the next slide? Because all of a sudden, I began to question about what about money? What does the Bible say about money? What is the tithe? What, wasn't tithing only under the Mosaic law? Actually, you know, the very first time that the word tithe is mentioned is with Abraham and Melchizedek, and that was actually 400 years before the Mosaic law. Did you know that, that, that tithing is not actually even about money? It's actually about the condition of your heart. It's actually about the, the difference in defining between ownership and stewardship. See, God doesn't want you to become the owner of anything. God wants you to become the steward of, of things that are actually his because God actually wants ownership over everything. This is going to be the quietest the King's Church has ever been because <laughs> it's a touchy subject. And all of these questions right here, I answer in here and more. I actually have a chapter in here that I think will probably blow your mind. And the name of it is called the Financial Statement of Jesus. See, most people believe that Jesus and all of his disciples were poor. I'm going to show you today where that's not true. In fact, I challenge you to find me one place in the Bible that God says that he wants us to be poor or that we no longer should tithe anymore. In fact, anybody that's here, I will give you a thousand pounds. Boy, they just came awake now, Dave. I'll give you a thousand pounds if you can find me one, just one, one scripture that says that God wants us to be poor or God says, don't worry about honoring me and tithing any longer. A couple of people in the back really looking through their Bible now, you know. Please don't come up to me and quote to me about Jesus said, blessed are the poor, because that's not what he said. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. There's not one place in the Bible. Folks, I have spent 35 years studying this one subject. Wonderful. I guess you could call me a biblical economist. And I'm going to show you, if, in fact, could we just go to the next slide? Because here's what's, what's amazing as you actually, the, by the way, these, these are the actual resources. Uh, we have another book that, uh, that I just finished writing just a few months ago called Your Journey to Financial Freedom. This is actually the seminar that we're going to be doing tomorrow evening. Um, so you might want to pick up a copy of that. This is all practical, whereas this one is more biblical. And then we used to carry around a stack of all these CDs on biblical economics, on um, doing finance God's way. And then I have a good friend of mine. Has anybody here ever heard of someone called Rabbi Daniel Lapin? Anybody ever heard that name? No? Okay. Well, Rabbi Lappin is a good friend of mine. He is an Orthodox rabbi. Now, I was born and raised in a Jewish family. And so I would be what they call a Messianic Jew. I don't know if any of you have ever heard that term or not. By the way, in case you didn't know, Jesus is Jewish too. Okay. So what we did is we took all of these CDs that used to cost total about a hundred quid for all the sets of the CDs and we put it on a USB and it cost about actually not even not even half that okay we have a total package on this that you can actually you know purchase and it's you know we have kind of a special package on the whole thing and Pastor Dave and Faye this one is for you okay there you go you got a whole set now God bless you guys can we go to the next slide, if you will? You know, um, this kind of shows where, where people, and my apologies, I think we got a 
couple of the, the letters are off because the, the, what is it, uh, Russ? It's the, the format that I sent it in doesn't sync up with the one that you've got here in Wales, okay? Mine doesn't speak Welsh or something like that, okay? But if you look down at the bottom, level one is struggling. I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands, but I'm sure that there are people in here that are really, really struggling. I mean, to pay the bills, to have enough food, to maybe you're out of work, maybe you're, st whatever, the, whatever the need might be. Guys, I was there. I don't know how many of you have ever been homeless. I was homeless for two and a half years. I don't know how many of you ever had to eat out of garbage bins. That's what I had to do for the first six months. And it's not any fun. And I'm here to tell you that God does not want you to struggle. Do you know, one of the toughest things for me when I got saved was to, I had to get my head straight because my natural father committed suicide, abandoned me, and all of a sudden I get saved and it's like, you mean God, God my father actually really wants me to do good and actually wants to bless me? Even Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you... You, he, said, he, said, he said, here you are. He said, whenever you're, you're children, he said, you want to give your kids good things. He said, if your kid asked for an egg, you wouldn't give him a scorpion. He said, how much more your heavenly father wants to bless you? And so I had to all of a sudden begin to understand that God didn't want me down there in that struggling position. And the next level, finally, I started making a living and I started getting solid. But I was a, a little bit like, like this with water. And if there, was a big, if there was a big wave or a big rain, I would have drowned. I was making my monthly payments. I was a tither. I was actually good at the 10%. But boy, the other, the other 90%, I was horrible. I was a mess. I was not a good steward over that other 90%. That wasn't God's fault. Some might go, well, you know, the reason why I can't tithe is because I have too much debt. Well, that wasn't God's fault. I mean, I don't know about you, but God's never forced me to pull out my MasterCard or Visa and say, charge. That was my decision. And then finally, the next one is stable where you're actually in a position where you're not only, you're not only probably, you know, potentially debt free, maybe you have a mortgage on the house, but you don't have a lot of debts. In fact, you have surplus, the next level up. The, top two, the, the problem with the, with the bottom two is that you're always kind of scrounging around for scraps. You're always struggling. You've always got that, I call it the smell of the hunt. The problem with the top two is complacency. We, we were talking back in the green room earlier, and boy, I've heard this all around the world as I've traveled. I've heard people say, you know, I'm doing okay. What, what, what do I need to go make money for? Wow, what a selfish statement. I want to tell you the reason why. is because there's lots of other people that are still down in the other two levels. See, the, the, the scripture in faith quoted, it says, the life of the generous gets larger and larger. The life of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Jesus said, he said, give and it shall be given to you. The problem is with giving, you know, I, I have people all the time that as I travel around, I hear all these things like, I don't tithe, but I just give out of the goodness of my heart. Sounds spiritual, but I'm going to be totally honest with you today. If I gave out of the goodness of my heart, I wouldn't give anything. <laughs> because we as human beings are basically selfish by nature. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I guarantee you all of you would love to be in the surplus and not down in the struggling area. If we could go to Proverbs 22, 5 through 7. How many of you have ever heard this scripture before that says, train up a child in the way they should go and they'll not depart from it. It's, it's taught for kids like this down here. You say, man, I'm going to train my kids up in church. And if they go out in the world, okay, then if I train them in church and they'll come back, well, that's a pretty good way to explain it, except that's not the Jewish way to explain it. And in case you didn't know, Solomon who wrote this is Jewish. I'm going to give you the Jewish interpretation. Let's go through it. 
It says, in the paths of the wicked are snares and pitfalls, but those who would preserve their life stay far from them. Start children off on the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. I want to show you this is a financial scripture because the very next verse says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. See, poverty can become a generational thing. It's a mentality. And when you live your life in debt, and when you live your life in struggle, your children see that that's how that you're living, so I guess that's how I should live. And in order to be able to break that yoke of thinking, you have to make a conscious effort to really understand what God's Word has to say about it. Not what you think about it. I have people all the time, again, as I travel around the world, they say, well, Jeff, this is what I think. I go, well, does it line up with God's word? Because quite honestly, I don't really care what you think. Scripture says you can believe a lie and be damned. Ooh, it's really quiet in here now, isn't it? Okay. You know the great thing I love about visiting a church like this? I'm leaving leaving on Tuesday. (laughs) I didn't come here to try to get money from you. I came here to get you more blessed so that you can be a bigger blessing to the community. It's so easy for us to say it's us four and no more. We're doing okay inside here in the four walls of our church. But what about, the, what about the other community out there? What about the other people that were like me at 15 years old that were strung out on drugs and needing help. Somewhere out here in Newport, in the surrounding communities, say within a 25 to 50 mile radius, which is where your main influence is, there are people today that are praying and questioning whether there really is a God. Luke 16 and 10, if we could go to Luke 16 and 10. These are not my words. These are Jesus' words. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. See, when I was 16 years old making $30 a week, all the teenagers were laughing at me as I put my money in the offering. They said, God doesn't need your $3. And I said, I understand that. But I showed them this scripture and I said, see, if God can't trust me with 30 Why would he ever give me 300 or 3,000 or 30,000 or 300,000 or 3 million? See, the, the number is irrelevant in God's eyes. And as you begin to grow in the level of, of, of spiritual maturity, then God can entrust you with more as you prove yourself. See, there's a difference in God's love for you and God's trust in you. God's love is totally unmerited. I don't care what you've done in your life. God looks at you, whether you've accepted him in your life or not, God looks at you and says, I love you. You are my child. And I love, just like all of you uh, that, that have children, you might not approve of what your kids do, but you still love them in spite of maybe what they've done. But see, can God trust you? And as the scripture goes on to say here, so if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, then who will give you property of your own? He said, but whoa, 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 wait a minute, Jeff, don't you know that it's my house, it's my job, It's my money. No, actually, it's not. It's actually all God's. And God wants you to be a steward or a manager over it. Verse 13, no one can serve two masters. I don't know how many people have quoted this scripture to me and said, see, you can't have money because you can't serve two masters. That is not what Jesus is saying here. What he's saying is either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. 
And actually, the, the original version said mammon. Well, see, you have to understand that back at Jesus' time, they had different gods that there were. And there was something called the God of Mammon. And as people would be in the marketplace, and as they were packing up, they would say, how did today go? Did the God of Mammon serve you well? And Jesus is saying, you cannot serve God and money. He didn't say you couldn't have money. He just said you can't serve it. At Hillsong, I also serve as the stewardship pastor. But really... I'm a worship pastor. I teach you to worship God, not money. Money is the easiest thing to replace God, as I'm going to show you here. Can we go to the next slide, if you will? Here's what's interesting as I've studied the scriptures. There's 500 places in the Bible that talk about prayer. There's 500 places in the Bible on faith. There's over three and a half thousand scriptures that actually reference money in the Bible. Seven times more scriptures than either about faith or money. And here's what's amazing. Ten times the number of scriptures about praise and worship that there are about money. And yet... When the pastor gets up and speaks for 10 minutes on it, people say, all they ever talk about is money. <laughs> and they spoke about it for two minutes receiving an offering. 70% of Jesus' parables were about money. So if you didn't like today, you probably wouldn't have liked hanging around with Jesus because that's what he talked about 70% of the time. Ecclesiastes 10 and 19 says, money answers all things. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. You might say, well, I don't like that. Well, I guess just get a knife and cut that scripture out then. But here's what I have found about money. How you act with money is how you probably handle the most of your life, the rest of your life. See, giving does three things in our lives. Number one, it shows who we really trust. See, do you really trust your job, your employer, or your business, if you're in business like, like I am for myself? But it really shows that you're actually trusting God. See, it takes no faith to not tithe. But when you're tithing and you're giving 10%, what you're really saying to God is you're saying, God, I believe that you have the ability and the power to actually multiply and actually to give me a 10% increase, minimum. Now, I want you to know, I do not give to get. That's not why I give. I give because he first gave to me. But the second reason to give is to prevent greed in your life by putting him first. Like Faye and Dave, Margot, my wife and I, that's how we tithe every single month on the first of the month comes directly out of our direct debit. See, don't tell me how much you love God until you can show me your bank statement because I can tell you how much you love God. Jesus said, where your treasure is, not where your heart is. He said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So who do you put first? The mortgage payment? Is MasterCard your master? Or is he your master? I think you're going to get a few emails saying, please don't have that guy back, okay? I know you all are processing this. Always define your success by your obedience to God. See, blessing is always on the other side of obedience. And tithing is not about money. It's about the condition of your heart. Did you know that really tithing, the, the actual word tithe means a tenth, but it's also, it says, set aside the tithe as something that's holy to the Lord. The very first type of a tithe wasn't called a tithe, but the very first type of a tithe was actually in the Garden of Eden. And God created all of the, the garden 
And he said to Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, everything in the garden is yours except, see that one little tree over there? It's called the garden, it's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That has been set aside as holy to me. And I don't know why it is, but we as human beings want things that we can't have. I want you all to think about this. Adam and Eve had everything except one tree. But they had to have that one tree, didn't they? <coughs> Prior to that, ladies, it, when, if, if Eve would have had children, would have been no, no pain. I mean, they just would have went. <laughs> Natural childbirth. That was part of the fall. That's when God said, and, and he said, he said, Eve, he said, in bearing children, he said, it's going to be painful. Prior to that, there were no weeds. But he said, that's part of the curse now. Tell you what, if I was a woman, when I get to heaven, the first one I'd see is Eve and I'd slap her. <laughs> Say, woman, what were you thinking? Man, you had everything except that one little tree. All this pain you've caused all of us all these years. I'm going to go to the next slide. You know, we have to learn how to live beyond ourselves. And what I love about some of the things that you're doing here at King's Church, as I've heard over the last year, and today you refreshed my memory, and the baskets, and just the love that you're showing to the community. And as you look at, there's so many needs, there's orphans, and widows, and homeless, and food banks, and poverty, and education. In fact, if you go online, there's over 180,000 charities here in the United Kingdom. And they're everything from taking care of kids to taking care of pets. And I don't care what it is that, 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 that's got a soft spot in your heart. For me, it's kids. It's orphan kids because that's how I grew up. It's homeless kids because that was me. But did you know that all of these charities, all the things that you would like to be able to do if you were in that surplus category, it all takes one thing, and it's all about money. I'm sorry, guys, but that's what makes the world go round. You may not like it. You may not like the money game, but you better learn how to play it. In fact, you better learn how to win it. <laughs> that's what we teach you tomorrow night, the practical stuff. You know, I mentioned that, that giving is a form of worship. And the word worship, I'm going to be teaching you a little bit of Hebrew today, is the word shachad. Can you say that? Shachad. Kind of sounds Welsh, doesn't it? Okay. And that word means to bow down or to submit to. The reason that we raise our hands in church is a sign of surrender. It's just like if, some, if a robber, <coughs> excuse me, was coming up to you and said, stick them up. You put your hands up and it means I give up. That's the reason why that we worship God in church is because we say, God, it's, I give up. I, it's, it's all yours, God. It's not mine. And when we receive an offering, and when we give in an offering, it's actually a form of worship. It's, it's to bow down. It's to submit to God's ways. Margo and I were, were having dinner uh, yesterday. And we, were, we were just chatting about, because we, we grew up, I met Margo when we were, when we were 15 years old. Right after I got saved, she was the only other hippie in the high school. She fell in love with my ponytail, and I fell in love with her frizzy hair, and we dated from 16 to 19, and got married at 19, and we've just celebrated a few months ago our 41st wedding anniversary. Amen. Someone asked her if she'd ever thought about divorcing me. She said no, but murder several times. <laughs> so. But we were chatting about our childhood and, and I said, Margo, I said, what was it like when, 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 you know, when, when you first met me? And she said, boy, she said, you were so cocky. 
She said, you had a problem with authority. I want to ask you all a question. Be honest with me. How many of you in here, whether it's now or sometime in your life, ever had a problem with authority? Okay. Come on, guys. Raise your hand here, okay, on the front row here. None of us like to be told, you have to do this. Am I right? Here's good news. God is not up there pointing his finger at you saying you have to tithe. You get to tithe. I want to show an example. I think I've got, who is it, Haley, that I'm going to get to use today? Steve or Steve? Come on up, Steve. Now, I want to go to Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. And the reason that we chose Steve is because Steve has got a really cool goatee. And, um, hi Steve, I'm Jeff. Good to meet you. And so you might want to get your iPhone out for this, okay? This is called a talit or a talus. How many of you have ever seen one of these? Maybe if you've seen like at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, maybe pictures of it and all the Jewish men. So can we get you to just kind of step up here, Steve? There you go, face out to everybody. There you go. Somebody said he's Jewish now. So I'll tell you what, I'll make you an honorary Jew today, but don't worry about the other ceremony that we normally have to do. (laughs) Requires a very sharp knife, okay? So Now, Jesus would have worn one of these. And do you know, how many of you remember the scripture when it says that Jesus was walking through the crowd and there was a woman that touched the hem of his garment? How many of you remember that? Okay. Well, actually what she touched was this. And this actually, and it wasn't even a talit that he was wearing. He was actually wearing what they call a tzitzit, which actually went around his waist, okay? Okay. It's actually a garment, and it actually was a shirt, and then it had this coming out, and she actually reached over and touched the seat seat. But this is actually used whenever we worship God. And here in Deuteronomy, this scripture is actually read today, just like it was in Jesus' day, as it's something called the Shema. And here's what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your strength. Now, what this is, is this is not talking about the Godhead where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What it's saying is, is God, you are number one in my life. You, you, God, are the center of my life. And in order to be able to get the full scripture here, can I get this, this, uh, this um, baguette? I actually don't need the ruler, just the baguette. Okay. Can I give you that, Haley? Thank you. I would like for this to represent your income, however big or small it is. And Steve, if, if you could just break off what you would estimate to be about 10%, about 10%. There you go. So here's what the scripture says. And again, if you really want to know more about this, study the book, study the materials, okay, that we've got. The scripture in Malachi says, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse. And guys, there are literally hundreds of scriptures that talk about tithing. In fact, Jesus talked about tithing. He said to the Pharisees, he said, you tithe of anise and mint and cumin. In other words, he said, you got little, little mint plants with 10 stems and you pull one off. That's how precise you are. He said, you should have tithed, but you should not have left the more important things off, which were judgment, love, and mercy. See, the problem was, it was all about, it was all about, I'm a tither. See how great I am. Let me say this to you. God loves you just as much, whether you're a tither or you're not a tither. 
but I want to show you the difference in a tither and a non-tither. So here's what the scripture says in Malachi, I bring you all the tithe into the storehouse. The storehouse is your local church where you're getting fed spiritually. My local church is Hillsong London. That's the covering that I'm under. Now, this scripture here actually reads in Hebrew, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all of your soul is actually in Hebrew is the word mind, and the word strength here is the word medecha. Can you say medecha? That word, I don't know how in the world the translators got strength, because that's not what medecha means. What medecha means in Hebrew is all of your possessions and your money. So this scripture in Hebrew actually says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all of your possessions. So this represents your income. And when you tithe, can you hold that up to you sort of like this here, Steve? What happens is, is when you tithe, your income now comes under the covering of God. And now that 90%... God can stretch 90% fuller than you can actually take 100%. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I understand it doesn't make any sense. Neither does accepting Jesus and accepting him and having the forgiveness of sins. But let's just say that Steve says, you know, I don't believe in all that tithing stuff. That's, you know, and so he just, he decides he's going to keep it for himself. He says, I'm not going to worry about it. I want to show you spiritually what happens is, is the covering in that area of your life comes off of that. And God stands over here and God says, Steve, I, I, I still love you. You're still going to heaven, but you made a decision to not enter into covenant with me. It's your decision. Good luck, Steve. Because <laughs> you're on your own. So you've made a decision to come out from underneath that covering and to do it your way. And God says, no problem. I'm not going to argue with you. But when things start happening in your life, don't expect the supernatural because you didn't do the natural. And it's this easy, guys. You don't have to go in sackcloth and ashes. All you got to do is say, okay, God, I'm going to come into covenant with you. I'm going to start tithing. And all of a sudden, the covering of God comes over your life in that area of your life. That's how simple it is. Just like accepting Jesus in your life. And you don't have to, you don't have to, to beat yourself, okay, with, or, or get caned, you know, and go into mourning, okay? It's that easy to say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Same thing with tithing. Very good, Steve. Steve, you can actually have this baguette. <laughs> Congratulations. Can we go to the next slide, please? Next slide. You know, all of us have to deal in these four different areas of our life. In the upper left-hand corner is your spiritual life. We'll talk about that in a moment. Our financial life, our health, and our relationships. Did you know that God's Word actually talks about all four areas of, the, of this? I'm not going to take the time to go into it today, but in, in relationships, you know, the Scripture tells us how that we can actually have a great marriage. Margo and I have been married for 41 years. I still buy her chocolates. I still buy her flowers. And did you know the scripture says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. The men probably won't like this, but the women will. I can tell you how to have a great marriage. Treat them like you did when you were dating them. Some of the guys are going, oh man. Still open the door. I think it's called honor and respect. You say, Jeff, do you ever have any disagreements with your wife? Yeah, I had one this morning at breakfast. <laughs> Wanted to say something, but I didn't. See, the word love in the Bible does not mean some ooey-gooey thing. It actually, the word love in Hebrew actually means faithfulness, loyalty, steadfastness. When the scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, it meant 
that he was loyal, he was faithful. So when you say, I love God, here's a question. How faithful are you in those different areas of your life? In the area of health. I was having lunch a few years ago with, with Pastor Gary, my, our past lead pastor at Hillsong, and he was having some pork and shellfish. And I, he said, you don't eat that, do you? Because you were raised Jewish. I said, no, I said, I don't eat pork or shellfish. He said, do you think someone wouldn't go to heaven if they don't eat pork or if they eat pork and shellfish? I said, no, actually, Pastor, I think you get the, to heaven a little bit quicker. You can't go to McDonald's every day and eat Big Macs and expect to walk in divine health. God's word tells you that your body is the temple of the living God. We're supposed to take care of it. And then in the area of financial, we've already been talking about that. I want to go to Deuteronomy 8 and 10. How many of you pray before you eat? Okay. How many of you don't like to raise your hands in church? <laughs> Deuteronomy 8, this is what the Lord told, he said, when you've eaten and you're satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. He actually wanted us to praise him after we've eaten. You know the reason why? It's so easy to become ungrateful and forgetful once you've received something. Same thing as marriage. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God. See, most of us will, will get spiritual amnesia if God would bless us too much. And when you do not tithe, really what you're saying to God is you're saying, God, I, I trust you in, in these other three areas in my life, but in this one area of finance, God, you and I are going to have a prenuptial agreement. I don't want you to be involved in, in that area of my life. I got that one under control. And he goes on to say, be, 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 be careful you don't forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commandments, his laws, his decrees I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and you're satisfied, when you build fine houses and you settle down, and when your herds and your flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all that you have is multiplied. I don't know about you, that doesn't sound to me like poverty. God's saying, I, I want to bless you. But when I do bless you, I want you to understand that human instinct is to forget me. Let's go down to verse 17 and 18. And he says, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hand has gotten me this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for it's he that gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant that he swore to his ancestors today. In other words, the real purpose of wealth is God wants to bless you so you can actually become a blessing to others. I want to go to one last scripture in Matthew 19. It's the story of the rich young ruler in the 16th verse. And he says, then a, a man came up and said, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus goes on to say to him, he says, keep the commandments. And he said, which ones? I want you to count with me. He says, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbors yourself. How many is that? Six. I don't know about you. I never heard about Moses and the six commandments. I guess Jesus didn't go to Hebrew school and learn the other four. And the young man said, I've kept all these from my youth up. What do I lack? And Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, the word perfect means shalom. Shalom means complete or perfect. He said, if you want to be complete, Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor. He never told him to give it all. So many scriptures that people misquote. He said, sell what you have and give to the poor and then come and follow me. In other words, he said, I want you to come into ministry with me, but I want you to learn this principle of giving. And it says the young man, when he heard it, he went away sad because he had great wealth. By the way, it never does say if he ever came back and maybe changed his mind. And then Jesus looked at his disciples. He said, truly, I tell you, it's, it's hard. Can everybody say hard? It's hard for someone who's rich 
He didn't say it was impossible. He just said it's hard for someone that's rich to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And he said, I tell you, it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom. And his disciples heard it and they said, this is fantastic because we're broke. We don't have any money. So we're all going to heaven. Is that what it says? See, these, all of his disciples, Jesus is Jewish. All of his 12 disciples are Jewish. They all understood Deuteronomy that said, I'll bless you in your houses and your lands and your silver and your gold and all that you have is multiplied so the nations of the world can know my covenant. They understood that to be blessed means that you can then be a blessing. And they said to Jesus, Jesus, then if a rich man can't get in, then who can be saved? And here's what Jesus says. See, most people quote this scripture and it's not a faith scripture, it's a financial scripture. He said, with man, this is impossible. Can we go to the next slide, please? With the circle. He's saying, when you put yourself in the middle, you can't do it. You cannot get to heaven on your own. But let's go to the next slide because Jesus goes on to say, but with God, all things are possible. See, when you put God as number one, when you make him the CEO of your life, when you put him as the center of your life, in your spiritual life, in your finances, in your relationship, in your health, that's when the scripture says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. In other words, someone that has God as the focal point of their life, where they're under his covering, that's when you know that God's blessings are on you in every single area. Can I get all of you to just bow your heads and close your eyes as we close this service here today? And I'd just like to pray for you. In fact, I'd like to pray for people in every single area. And I'd like to first ask you to be totally honest. Nobody, nobody's looking around except for me right now. And maybe you've got some broken relationships in your life. Might be with someone at work, might be someone in your family, might be someone right here in church that's sitting on the opposite side of church. And there's just something there, something, a sort of a root of bitterness, and you just can't quite get it through it. And you know that the scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And you want to get that right. If that's you and you've got a broken relationship and you'd like for God to put a balm some salve on that wound and heal that relationship so that both of you can move on. Would you please raise your hand so I can pray for you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so honest. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. In the area of health, maybe you're having some, some challenges in your, in your health. It could be a, a, a foot, a back. Could be you went to the doctor and he said, I'm sorry, but you need to put your, your orders, your, your life in order because you got uncur incurable cancer. Did you know, as Faye said, he's not the physician. He's not a GP. He's the great physician. He's actually the GP, the great physician. He, by his blood are you healed. By his stripes are you healed. If that's you today and you're struggling in the area of health, and you'd like it for us to pray for you, would you please raise your hand? Thank you. So many needs. And finally, in the area of finance, I know it's a, it's a touchy subject, but God wants to get involved in every single area of your life. And he loves you. You might say, oh, Jeff, you don't know how bad I've messed up. No, he still loves you. It doesn't matter. I don't care how good a shape you're in, whether you're in that surplus category, whether you're down on the bottom. God loves everybody. Scripture says he has no respecter of persons. If that's you today, and maybe you've never come into covenant with God, or you would like that supernatural on your life, and you're ready to take that step in the natural and say, God, I want to be more blessed. I want to be able to, to, to have more so, so I can do more. If that's you today, would you raise your hand in the area of finance? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father God, I come to you today 
I break the spirit of bondage over these three areas, over the financial, over the health, over the relationships, and I pray, God, restoration. And even as your word says in Malachi that you, you would, would, would rebuke the devourer. Today, Father, I rebuke the devourer and the enemy off of our lives. Your word said you came to give us life and that life that's more abundant. Yet you said that the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, today we bind that spirit in these three areas. And finally, with every head still bowed, all eyes closed, the most important part is your spiritual life. Jesus said, what does it gain you if you gain the whole world? What does it profit you if you gain the whole world but you lose your own soul? He never said that you, that you shouldn't do well or you shouldn't gain the world. He said, but if that's all that you've got, you've got a pretty empty life. If you've never accepted Jesus in your heart today and you're tired of struggling it in that area and doing it on your own, or maybe at one time you did accept Jesus and for some reason the cares of the world pulled on you and you're not as close to him today as what you'd like to be, He's standing there today with his arms open wide saying, son, daughter, I still love you. If that's you today and either you've never accepted Jesus in your life as your personal Lord, as your personal Savior, would you raise your hand here today so we can pray for you? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Be bold. It really is that simple to just say, Jesus, come in my heart today. Could I get all of you to just stand with me here today and repeat after me, if you will, and then I'll turn it over to Pastor Dave or over to the, to the musicians. In fact, could the rest of the musicians, I, I guess, join us on, on stage? Can we all repeat this? Dear Jesus, all together, dear Jesus, I invite you in my heart today to be the Lord of my life, to be the center of my life, in my finances, in my health, in my relationships, and in my spiritual life. Today, I make you the Lord of my life. I move out of the driver's seat and over in the passenger seat. And I make you the driver of my life. I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give all these people a big hand. God bless you.